Genesis 9, if you please. And if you don't, I don't know what you're going to do. But I'm reading out of Genesis 9. Good to be here this afternoon. That nice weather we're having. It's going to be good this week. Keep it cool down for everybody. Genesis chapter 9, we um, started on this last Sunday, uh, teaching about the clouds, one of my favorite, one of my all-time favorite uh, topics in the Bible, believe it or not, because it's the sign that Jesus told us to watch for, told us to look. God understands that we don't see into the future, we can't. He understands that we've never seen Jesus, so all the paintings and all the statues that are of Jesus, that ain't him. What does he look like? I don't know. So he told us in his word, since the Bible doesn't come with artwork and photography in it, given to us by God, we have to rely upon the description that the Bible's giving us of what to look for at the return of Jesus. And what to look for is he's coming in the clouds. Now, um, years ago, I had heard that, you know, almost all the religions are looking for one of their demigods, one of their saviors, one of their whatever, one of their prophets to return, to come back. In Islam, they are looking for forward to the return of a person they, that is known as the 12th Imam. An Imam, I-M-A-M, I guess is like some, it would be like an apostle for us, I think, is the equivalent of it. But he's supposed to return and establish a Islamic state all over the world. In other words, everybody in the world will bow down before the religion of Islam or get your head cut off. Um, and everybody will have to pray five times a day facing Mecca and all that stuff they do. And you have to marry five-year-old girls. Because that's what, that's what um, Muhammad did. He married a, uh, an immediate member of the family, a close relative, and she was barely... If I remember right, I don't remember exact age, but somewhere around 10, 11, 12 years old, okay? It's just an excuse is what it is. And believe it or not, in a lot of Muslim, predominantly Muslim nations where they adhere to it, they, to them, Muhammad is the man to follow. It's just like we follow Jesus, they follow Muhammad. So since Muhammad married a relative, they're marrying relatives. And it's dirtying up the gene pool. They're having a lot of problems with genetics, as you would figure. So anyway, but I found out, I'm thinking, okay, he's going to come down from heaven and shine the light of Islam for everybody. But I found out he wasn't in heaven. Found out that he was down in a well somewhere in Iran, and there is a mosque there to commemorate it, and when this great teacher, Sterling, comes back, he's going to rise up out of a hole in the ground. What does that sound like to you? Revelation 9, 11, where Abaddon is the king of the bottomless pit, and he ascends up out of the bottomless pit. And I'm going, I know who that is. So, Jesus gave us these things in the Bible to be able to recognize who he is. And he said, the sign that you're going to look for He's coming in the clouds. He's coming in the clouds. The beast is not. He's going to rise up out of the sea. Whatever that means, we're going to know it on that day. But when Jesus appears, I guarantee you we're not going to miss it. Not going to miss it. So to me, this is very important. Genesis 9, verse 8. Uh, God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you, and of the fowl of the and of the fowl and of the cattle and of every beast of the earth with you. So it's four with you, this man, fowl, and cattle, and every beast of the earth, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. 
And I will establish, verse 11, I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Then he says in verse 12, and God said, this is the token. This is it right here, this covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I, when I bring a cloud over the land. And that's what we talked about last Sunday night. The, what that cloud actually is. I mean, there's clouds almost every day. And every time a thunderstorm comes up, we don't expect Jesus. That's got to be Jesus there. It's a different kind of cloud. It's a cloud of un godly beings beasts devils okay gog coming over and i'm going to back up a little bit i know i touched on that last sunday but I'll back up on a little just a little bit to get our to get our memory straight when i bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud verse 15 now remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Verse 17, And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the... And, yeah, uh, Sister Sandy... Um, she brought me a little piece of paper with all the places where the cloud was mentioned, where the bow was mentioned, the covenant was mentioned, and the token. Token's in there three times. Bow is in there three times. The cloud is four times. Okay? Now, could be just a coincidence, but I see order in everything in God's Word. Four it's the number four, spiritual things as well as the gospel. So it's not a regular, ordinary, everyday cloud. This is a different one. Covenant, seven times. That's the number four, perfection, complete. And I like that. I appreciate that. And some of you counted uh, for us last week, and I appreciate that. But anyway, verse 17, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And remember, this is an unconditional covenant. He makes no condition upon mankind. Man, nor beast, nor anything that is in the earth has to do a certain thing in order to receive this. It's an absolute guarantee. If, you, if McDonald's does the whole Monopoly game, where if you get the game piece and you get a million dollars, how many of you know that you don't have to buy something to get one of those game pieces? Okay, do you know why you don't have to buy something to get a game piece? Because it's the difference between a lottery, which is a gambling, and a sweepstakes, which is not gambling. So they say no purchase necessary. If they make you buy a hamburger to get a game piece, that's a lottery, and that's by the law, that has to be regulated by the government, and, and it's illegal in most states. Okay, So they can't do it. They can have a sweepstake, so they can have free giveaway. So if you go to McDonald's, get one of those game pieces. It by chance you get what is it, Boardwalk and Park Place or Park Boardwalk or whatever, you get the million dollars. Okay, so that's that's I bring that up because in this particular covenant, God says no purchase necessary. You don't have to do anything. I'm not ever going to destroy the earth with a flood again. Here's the token of my promise, and I intend to keep my promise. Whereas with salvation, salvation is a different kind of covenant. It does require one thing. Not a Big Mac. Belief. Faith. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. You must believe that, all right? Let's go to prayer. Father, bless your word tonight.
Bless it for these people's sake and all who hear. We love you and we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Uh, turn to John 1 very quickly. I've got this in my mind about that bow. Um, J.R. and Callie. I'm going to ask you to, and Caleb, okay? Who knows the answer to this? What is it that creates a rainbow? What, how does a rainbow just show up? Okay? Are there leprechauns throwing, is there a unicorn flying through the air that leaves a trail? What? Water and sun. That's it. The clouds are up there. That's the water. And the light hits those droplets of water and creates that effect, a prism effect. You shine a light through a prism, a triangular piece of crystal or glass. It some, somehow diffracts the different colors that's in that light. Isn't it something that if you add red, blue, green, purple, whatever, all, all the colors there, when you add them together, you get white. But when I take those same crayons, I get black. I don't understand that, okay? But anyway, and there's seven different colors in that spectrum. Seven. God's perfection. And that bow, well, look at John 1. Look at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which, come, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Here you have light four times there. Okay, it, actually it's uh, one more time here later on. But anyway, the word light there is reference to Christ. He is the light. Remember when Jesus in Matthew 17, when he was transfigured, his face shown as the sun. Okay, so he's showing you who he is. In, in the book of Revelation, when John turned around to hear the voice, can you imagine? Here's Jesus standing behind him. His face is shining. His countenance is shining like the sun. Okay, that would just be... You don't do that to a 95-year-old man, which that's probably about John's age when he's writing the book of Revelation, okay? So it just, but anyway, Christ is that light. He's the light that is in that cloud. It literally is him in every way, shape, and form. Now, so we know a little bit about what the cloud represents. We talked about that last Sunday. So uh, let me touch on a couple of things. Ezekiel 38 uh, look at verse 16. We know that Gog is a chief prince, a principality, a spirit, a little g, God. That's what he is. And since he's a principality, he controls people on this earth. And I believe that. I believe that people are led about by a spirit. Ephesians 2.2. 2. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Um, that video I recommended you to watch, by the way, um, Shadow, Shadowgate. The lady that made the video got arrested while it was uploading. And is in jail now. Okay? And I told the guys in my office, when you arrest somebody... I'll ask Cubby. He's our law enforcement expert here. Okay? If a prosecutor has charges in his hand on Monday, but waits to arrest somebody on Friday afternoon at 445, why is he doing that? Number of reasons. One could be that he wants them to sit in jail all weekend. Probably. Probably. If you arrest them on Monday, they can bond out Tuesday, maybe. If you arrest somebody late Friday afternoon, there's a good chance that prosecutor wants, he knows you're going to bond out, but you can't do it till Monday till judge shows up. 
So that she got arrested late Friday afternoon while the video was uploading. Robbery charges, domestic violence charges, a couple other things. I don't know if they were related to the video or what. Um, but the idea of that video is, is that they're collecting so much data on everybody that they can now use it to push people's buttons. If you know somebody and you know what triggers them, okay, if you know that there's somebody in your family that gets mad every time you say a certain word, and you say that word in front of them, what are you trying to do? Stir them up. Get them mad. My dad had something that he used to say about my mom, and I'm telling you, she didn't like it. And I'm not going to say it, because she might be listening. But it was bad. Anyway, so a spirit controls people. It knows them. It knows how to get them to do things. A principality, that's what it does. And Gog, I believe, is that kind of spirit. So in verse 16, Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in the O Gog before their eyes. God had done this before. Remember, there's no new thing under the sun. When Israel is camped out at the banks of the Red Sea, God went and stirred up Pharaoh, pushed his button. Pharaoh said, why did I let those Jews go? So he mounted up his chariots, grabbed his soldiers, and went riding hard after them. I'm going to catch them, I'm going to kill every one of them. They're not going to get away with this. God has done this before. And why did God do that? To show forth to the heathen that he's God. I mean, the nine plagues still didn't do it. The ten plagues still didn't do it. The eleventh thing God did with Pharaoh, that showed him right then and there. Of course, Pharaoh's dead now. But that showed him right then and there, God is God. And that's why he did it. I'm going to get my glory out of this. And he said, I will be sanctified in the Ogog before their eyes. So we see that here's a principality, a devil. And God depicts him as a cloud, him and his army, to cover the land. So that army is coming. It's on its way. Uh, Jeremiah 4.13. Behold, he shall come up with his clouds, and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. And there is an army coming to this world. An army that did not originate here. They're coming up out of the pit. They're coming down from the heavens. God's going to, it's the angels that get kicked out of heaven. No, I don't believe Martians live on Mars and they have spaceships. I don't believe that. I believe these are devils that God is going to thrust out of heaven. They're going to come up out of the pit to cover the land as a cloud. Now, Exodus 19, this is where they met God. It came to pass on the third day in the morning. Here we have a third day time prophecy. That there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. Uh, touched on this last Sunday so that all the people that was in the camp trembled and Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mountain. And God says in Isaiah 44, 22, I blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins, return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. So that cloud and that event, there's an event that's going to take place. It's going to have multiple, as with God, it's going to have multiple, um, multiple reasons for happening. God's going to give this world what they ask for, what they have coming. He's going to pour out his vengeance and his wrath on this world. He's going to let... The world come underneath cruel authority. Then, um, boy, so that car there, the light is hitting. All right, Callie, keep your head just like that. No, you don't have to worry about that. Okay. But anyway, that's, that's what he's doing. He's going he's gonna to cover the, he's going to give the earth what they're asking for. But he's going to redeem Israel at the same time. And he did that exact thing with the flood. He gave the world what they had coming. But he used that same 
thing to save his people. Boats don't float unless there's water to float them. Amen? Daniel 7, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came. This is where I'm going to set this idea up of the token is Christ. I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So Daniel's prophesying that one of these days, the Son of Man is going to come with the clouds of heaven heaven he's going to be seen in the clouds psalm 18 11, he made darkness his secret place and his, his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies psalm 57 10 for thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds remember satan lucifer wants to rise above the clouds he wants to rise above truth psalm 97 2 clouds and darkness are round about him righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne uh, Psalm 99 7 he spake unto them in the cloudy pillar they kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them Psalm 104 3 who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters who maketh the clouds his chariot have you ever seen clouds like this there's it's an actual meteorological event where the clouds will make a perfect circle in the sky and they it looks like a flying saucer and there Actual people have mistaken cloud formations for a flying saucer because it just makes this perfect disc-shaped object, and that's what you have in the scriptures. He maketh the clouds his chariot. Um, the cloudy pillar he mentions in Psalm 99. So the Bible's laying is establishing this idea that when these clouds come, look for Christ. Because that's going to be the sign. So now go to Matthew 24. This is very important, I believe. Very, very important. And Matthew 24, for me, years ago, uh, was a chapter that just, to me, it made no sense. Because I was told that, that all of that happens after the rapture. And it just, it didn't add up. Because then why didn't Jesus specify? Why didn't he say, you know, I shall come, gather my children, and then, you know, wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and earthquakes, and then all that's going to happen. But he didn't say it that way. Here's how Jesus said it. He said in verse 29, Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of God, those days and I'm I'm gonna we're gonna go to Revelation 19 in a minute to compare verses so have your Bible ready immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the Sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken so we have things mentioned here that are actually mentioned in other verses of scripture word for word verse 30 and then then shall appear the sign what was it we were looking at in Genesis 9 the token the token the sign a sign and a token same thing okay the sign of the um, What's in the verse? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. That's exactly what Daniel said. And I think Jesus is quoting Daniel here. In the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Uh, and if you look immediately after that, verse 31 and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one of heaven to the other. So the trumpets are going to sound. And Christ is going to, his angels are going to gather all of the saints, all of the elect. That's us. But some say, well, that's not us. It's at the end of a seven-year tribulation, is what they say. Now, let's go look at what does happen at the end 
of we'll call we'll call it the tribulation, but I I think that's a misnomer, but we'll call it that. Well, here's what happens when Christ returns to establish his 1000 year kingdom. I'll say it that way. Here's what happens. Verse 11 of Revelation 19. What's the first five words in that verse? I saw heaven open. What does that mean? No clouds. No clouds. I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Yes, our Savior is a warrior. He is. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Wouldn't you like to know that? You can't. It's not for you. That fascinates me. Anytime God says, nobody knows it, I'm going, come on. You can tell me. I won't say a word to nobody. Don't believe that. God knows me better. I have a big mouth. Verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. I love that. And it made it white. And his name is called the Word of God. You're holding it in your hand. You believe it. And the armies, that's us, which, followed, which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Looking forward to that. I've never ridden a horse, but I love them. If I were to pick a pet, I would pick a horse. Now, I don't know anything about horses, don't know how to take care of them, don't know how to break them, don't know how to saddle them, don't know how to ride them, nothing about them. But they are absolutely amazing animals. They are amazing. Okay? Smart. Remember the Pony Express? They rode those horses hard for miles. Okay? And Jesus, out of all of his creation, chose the horse to return on. And I think it has something to do with the fact that horses are not afraid in the day of battle, the Bible says. They see a sword, doesn't, doesn't affect them one bit. Out of his mouth, uh, excuse me, verse 14, our armies that followed, which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, we know what that is. That's the righteousness of Christ. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. So we know, and this is the King of kings, Lord of lords. Seven words. So we know this is Christ coming in Revelation 19. But there's no clouds here because heaven's been open. So I can't say that Matthew 24 is Jesus coming as he establishes his 1,000 year kingdom. I can't say that. Because I don't think the two events, to me, they're different. One, Jesus is coming in the day of clouds. The second one, heaven's open. The clouds have been rolled away. So, um, Matthew 26. Jesus says this again. That the sign to look for is the clouds. Matthew 26, 64. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say, and this is, he's on trial here. Art thou the Son of God? And he said, Thou hast said. You said it. And he's affirming it. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Where did Stephen see him? In that exact spot. When Stephen is being large stones being thrown at him to crush his skull and kill him, he gets to see Jesus up in heaven sitting at the right hand of the Father. And it's like, I don't care how many stones hit me. I, would I, want, God, I want it to be that way when I die. Okay? But he's coming in the clouds of heaven, right hand of power. That's where the book is. Luke 21. He says it a little bit differently here. Luke, 
Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21 are synoptic passages. They are speaking of virtually the same thing, but each one says it in a slightly different manner. And I think in the differences, you find some, of the, some more of the clues. Luke 21, 25, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's going to happen. And that's what uh, Jesus said in 24. The powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Um, and then he says, verse 27, And then shall they see this, the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And then he says, verse 28, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads. Redemption draw with nigh. It's going to happen, people. Our redemption is coming in the day of clouds. You ever had those days? Cloudy days? Things don't go well? You're in a bad way? You're in a bad mood? Things pile up? Pressure on you like you can't, you just can't tolerate it anymore? Lift up your heads. Don't look down in a well for your Savior. He's not there. Don't look in a grave. He's up there. And he's coming down here. Your redemption draws nigh. Now, Acts chapter 1, this is important. Just so that we don't misunderstand anything Jesus said, he, as he does, he illustrates it. Draws us a word picture of what it's going to look like. But with this one, you just turn the film backwards. Play it backwards, okay? Did you ever do that, Sterling, with your projector when you was making all those movies? Did you ever play them backwards? Isn't that funny? Okay. So watch this. Yeah! There is a famous film of Lisa as a little bitty girl falling into a box. Yeah, Sterling would rewind it, and then she would come back out of the box, fall back in the box, fall out of the box, fall in the box. Oh, I want to find that and put it on YouTube. <laughs> you have that on DVD, don't you? I thought I made a DVD of it for you. Well, I need to. I need to. Okay. The world's going to see this one day. All right. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. When he had spoken these things, in fact, let me, let me read you what he said, because that's important. Here's what he said. Um, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now that's the setup here. Are you now going to set up the kingdom? And no. Jesus, when he came the first time, it wasn't to set up the kingdom. Okay? When he comes the second time, it will be. I always draw the picture of David and Solomon. David is Christ's first coming. Solomon is Christ's second coming. They're both kings. David is the one who had to defeat his enemies and destroy the enemies. Solomon is the one who got to build the temple and reign with 1,000 wives. 700 wives, 300 concubines. But it's 1,000 total. So I see in that a picture, Christ at his first coming, David, who destroys the enemies, that's what Christ did on the cross, destroy the enemies, and then Solomon, who builds the temple and reigns a thousand years, or with his thousand women. How in the world did he do that? I don't know. But anyway, verse 6, wherefore, when they therefore were come, to, oh, I already read that, uh, they asked him, are you going to restore the kingdom? Verse 7, he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in, Judea, in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. 
And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Look at that. That's the film. Now reverse that film. Because the angels, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Reverse the film. If they filmed Jesus going up in a cloud, play it backwards, it looks like he's... That's how they did the $6 million man stunts. You know when the $6 million man jumped up on top of a 20-story building? Remember that? Remember that show? You know how they did it? They had a stunt man standing at the top of a building, and he stepped off and went straight down, landed, of course, on a big puppy thing, so it didn't kill him. And then they reversed the film. It looked like Steve Austin is jumping up on top of that building. That was the 70s, man. They didn't have computers for graphics. They had stunt men, amen? Real men. But it's going to happen exactly that way. A cloud came and received Jesus. How did Elijah go to heaven? Not in that chariot. In the whirlwind. The cl it's clouds. That's how Elijah went. That's how we're going. Revelation 1, turn there. Behold, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So when he comes, Sister Pam, how's he coming? What are we going to look for? The clouds. And again, I guarantee you, we're going to know it when we see it. And all these things that we've read are going to come into our heart, into our mind. We're going to say, I know what that cloud is. Now, I can't tell you what to look for as far as those clouds go. But I guarantee you, they're going to look so weird and so off that we're going to say, that's no ordinary cloud. Never seen anything like that. That's something different. Okay? And when it happens, inside that storm, that cloud that's coming over, the bow is going to be in that cloud. I want to I stop right here. Because I've got some neat things. And I don't, it's after 4 o'clock, and I don't want to hurry through the neat stuff. Okay? But this, to me, is so cool. And there's so many pictures of this all through the Bible. Once you learn what to look for, when you read it, you'll go, there's, there's another one. There's one right there. Oh, I see that now. That's pretty neat. That's Jesus coming in the cloud. Once you see it, you never forget it. Okay? So, again, we don't have any pictures of Jesus around here. Don't know what he looks like. No statues. All we have is scripture verses. I like that, amen? So we're going to recognize him by the thing that he told us to recognize. Think of this. How did the shepherds know where to look for baby Jesus? The angels gave him a sign. Told him what to look for. Okay? And we'll cover that next Sunday night. I love this. And you're only going to get something like this, not from me, but from a King James Bible. It is the only Bible that says things a certain way to where it makes sense. No other Bible can do this. That's why I love this book. And I'm not ever, not ever going to change Bibles on you guys. Never. Not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen, devil. I heard what you just said. Oh, you'll change. No, I won't. I'm telling you, I won't. 
Father, by your grace, I'll never change this book. Never, never go away from it. Never teach another Bible. Never say a better translation. I won't do it. You've convinced me. You brought me to the place where you not only just convicted my heart about it, but then you gave me the evidence. And I'm like that pastor in Kilimambogo who stood up and said, I, I've heard enough. I need no further evidence. I know, I know that this Bible is right in everything that it says. And there isn't a man or a devil in this universe that can convince me otherwise. And Father, these are important things. This is what you told us to look for, and we don't know what you look like. We've never seen you. We just believe in you. And if everybody's mind probably has a picture of what they think Jesus might look like, but you're you, and we're going to know who you are by those clouds. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Jesus for showing us what to look for. We need no further evidence. We need no further understanding. You told us to look for, the, look for your coming, your appearing in the clouds, and that's exactly what we're going to do. And we thank you that you still put rainbows in the clouds. We thank you, Lord, that you still do that. We love you for that. Thank you for making great promises to us that you never break. We love you and we ask your blessings in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. You are dismissed.